we will talk about ego. I'll just repeat that for the recording, actually. The first one is Nadine Andrews from the Climate Psychology Alliance. We'll be talking about uh, eco anxiety and managing emotions. After that, we have uh, Laura Young, uh, eco warrior, zero waste advocate, environmental activist, and ethical influencer. I'll give a talk um, titled Eco Anxiety in Social Media and the Online World. And the third speaker is Michelle Cassar, polymath, photographer, author, speaker, and filmmaker, who will give a talk uh, titled Helping People Cope with eco anxiety and um, before I forget she's also one of the founding members of city to see so without any further ado I'd like to um, stop sharing and pass the baton on to Nadine Andrews of the climate psychology alliance okay thank you and um, hi everyone so what I'm going to be doing with my um, part of the session is to introduce you to some of the ideas in climate psychology around um, what we refer to as climate distress um, more broadly than just uh, eco anxiety or climate anxiety. Uh, so a little bit of the kind of the psychology theory behind that um, as we find it useful for people to know a little bit about that. So I'm going to just begin with sharing my screen. Um, okay. So yeah, as um, as you just heard, I'm um, from the Climate Psychology Alliance. We've got a Scotland group, um, and in the past, well, particularly over the past two years, um, I've had in increasing numbers of requests to run sessions and and seminars and workshops on around climate anxiety. So it's something which is definitely becoming. Um, higher up in the kind of public consciousness. Um, so what, um, what, what we know is that um, the more that people learn about climate change and the reality of the crisis that we face, um, the more likely it is that feelings like these will come up for people. And um, anxiety is just one, um, but there's many other emotions. Um, like worry and grief and sadness and fear um, and anger. Um, and these are really powerful emotions that can be difficult to bear. Um, and what I'd like to just invite you to do quickly in the chat, um, and this won't be um, included in the video recording. Um, so if, if it's okay with you, just pop into the chat any emotions that you've experienced yourself. Um, and it can be multiple emotions. Um, just so I get a bit of a sense of, you know, um, who here has, has uh, just kind of what's been going on for you really. Um, for myself, um, I seem to have a bit of a baseline of sadness um, that's sort of there all the time. And then there's other emotions which, which come on top of that, that kind of come and go. But probably for me, sadness is the one that's there all the time. Um, now, um, yeah, and thank you for, for people who are, who are putting some stuff in the chat. Um, it's good just to acknowledge what the feelings are. Um, okay, now, um, oops. What um, we may also find is that what's normally called positive emotions, um, like happiness and excitement and hopefulness, um, can also be coming up. Um, now, it's not so much which particular emotions we feel, because probably um, all of us at some point feel um, some of these emotions, um, often um, several of them simultaneously, including those that might feel in conflict with each other. Um, so the point which I really want to make is that it's not so much which emotions we feel, but how we actually deal with them. Um, because it's how we ne negotiate these, these tensions and conflicts um, that is, is kind of one of the, the key issues here. Um, because that to a large extent influences um, and shapes our response to the ecological and climate crisis. And um, 
and influences whether the response that we have is adaptive or maladaptive, both on a personal level and ecologically. So, um, about eco-anxiety, um, so there's been, uh, well, there's more studies now. Um, there were very few studies even a couple of years ago. Um, it's become something where we've got a little bit more evidence now. So pre-COVID, um, going back to 20, early 2020, um, there were a couple studies that were done then um, that found a large proportion of people in the UK were experiencing stress and worry. Um, so between these studies, there was maybe around a third of adults um, that reported feeling anxious, overwhelmed, or had very high um, or high stress levels. Um, in the summer of 2021, um, so last summer, there was a, a study which I did as part of my job at Scottish Government. Um, I was leading the research on the Climate Assembly. And as part of that, we did a population um, survey where I, I asked some climate emotion questions. Um, and from that, around two thirds of adults in Scotland um, said that they were feeling worried or upset. Um, and about half said they felt overwhelmed. Um, and YouGov did a study, a UK study, um, asking a similar question. And they also found um, the same percentage, actually, two thirds. Um, that we're feeling worried. So this is a pretty large proportion of um, the population that is now recognizing that, you know, this is what they're feeling. Um, you may already be familiar with the global study that was um, published this, that came out just recently. Um, that was with 10,000 young people globally, um, 1,000 young people in 10 countries. So these were between the ages of 16 and 25. Um, Three in five um, were very or extremely worried, and almost half had uh, said their feelings were negatively affecting their daily lives. Um, we also know from psychotherapists, including a lot of um, psychotherapists who are part of the Climate Psychology Alliance, that there's rising levels of eco anxiety amongst people who are, um, you know, coming for therapy. Um, there was BBC News Round did a survey in 2000. Um, of 2008 to 16 year olds and um, about three quarters of them worried about the state of the planet. So, you know, these, that, these, all these studies are kind of saying very similar things really, um, which is that um, if you're feeling anxious or worried or sad or angry, then you're not alone because there's many, many other people feeling the same way. Um, now, what I want to emphasize is that whilst these feelings may be difficult to experience, um, in climate psychology, we say that these feelings can be understood as being appropriate responses, given the severity of the climate and ecological crisis that, that we face. Um, so feeling anxiety in and of itself is not a bad thing, um, but it's about how we regulate these emotions. Um, so in a way which is healthy and that motivates positive action um, rather than where it becomes or it exacerbates um, a mental health problem. Um, as we know from um, uh, the Scottish um, Health Survey, pre-COVID around one in four adults were affected by mental health problems in Scotland in any one year. Um, mental health services are already under-resourced and overstretched. And we know, you know from studies in the past couple of years because of COVID that mental health is an even greater issue now. So um, it's even more important that we have a good understanding of climate distress and, um, and how to manage our emotions around this in a healthy way because it's, it's not gonna go away. So let me say something about what is going on psychologically. Um, so anxiety arises when we perceive a threat consciously or unconsciously and um, site climate change um, the climate crisis poses profound ecological threat in a variety of ways that you can see here existential threat to life um, but also in terms of who we think we are um, our sense of self-worth and poses a threat to the kind of future that we thought we were going to have our life plans and um, our expectations about the future also our our 
what we think of as as you know our standard of living um what we think we we should be entitled to um all of these things it threatens these things in, in these ways um So, um, what happens when we perceive a threat? Um, so it causes, um, in terms of the, the physiology of, it, of stress, it causes disequilibrium dis in the body. Um, and stress is a, a biological and a psychological phenomenon. Um, now, the human tendency is to want to alleviate stress and to decrease associated emotions. So this is just what happens. In the body it's not something that, that we have to think about doing it's what our, our body wants to do um, to try and get back to baseline functioning as soon as possible um, and it, it it tries to alleviate stress through a variety of defenses and coping strategies um, so this is just part of normal human functioning um, and the reason that our our bodies want to do this is because prolonged stress um, creates major health problems, um, eventually leading to exhaustion and illness and ultimately leading to death. Um, now, these defences and coping strategies um, that kick in can have outcomes that are adaptive or maladaptive um, on a personal and, and an ecological level. So this means they can bring positive or negative benefits. Now then, um, Sorry, let me just go back here. So there are also various contextual forces that can influence how we perceive threats, how stressed we feel, um, what defences and coping strategies are used. And, um, and there's also various factors um, that affect, you know, how, how, how effective these strategies are, so how well they work. And these contextual forces operate, at, 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 they can operate at, at the level of a, of a society. So this is not just about what's happening within an individual, it, it happens at a societal level as well. Um, and the other thing to say about this is that these processes largely play out below the level of conscious awareness. So we're not always aware that we've really perceived a threat or that a defense or coping strategy is kicking in. So let's have a little look at um, maladaptive um, defenses and coping strategies. So. Um, these are strategies which um, inhibit our ability to deal with the reality of the situation and to, 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 to enact appropriate and proportional responses. So that's why they're ultimately maladaptive. Um, and this is a, I put this together from the various literature and some of my own research. Um, now, why would we, why would we want to do something which is maladaptive? Um, the reason is because um, they bring benefits. Um, so they like denial, distortion, avoiding thinking and feeling, all of these things defend us against actually having to feel um, these difficult emotions that come when we face up to the reality of something. So if we can deny the reality of it or distort it in some way um, or avoid thinking about it, then it means we don't need to actually it protects us from, from taking responsibility and having to take significant action. Um, some of these, um, if, if you remember in the previous slide, um, where um, here, you know, if there's threats which are affecting self-esteem and identity, then there's, there's defenses which might help to boost our sense of um, the self-enhancement here. So there's ways that some of these might protect our sense of, health, of self and enhance our self-esteem. Um, the diversionary stuff activity here, so this is like really minor stuff, which doesn't really make a difference, but it, it can help to, to kind of mollify guilt. Um, it defends us against feeling helpless and hopeless, reasserts a sense of being in control, but doesn't, you know, really do anything in, in the greater sense of actually addressing, you know, the major problems. So we can see why these are really attractive, these defences and coping strategies. Um, you know, um, and, and how tempting it can be to fall into one or other of these. And all of us will, to, to varying extent. So there's no one that's exempt from this. Um, now, um, in the second slide here, oops, um, here are um, some of the 
Adaptive coping strategies, so these are ones which do help us to adjust the reality of the situation and help to stimulate appropriate and proportional actions. And the one which we're focusing on is really this one around emotion regulation here. So it's about how we engage with and work through difficult emotions rather than, you know, try to avoid them or suppress them. Um, now, as I said um, earlier, uh, that facing up to the reality um, can, can be triggering all kinds of emotions that are difficult to be with. Often these emotions are called negative, but, um, but in, in, in climate psychology, we prefer just to call them difficult emotions. And that's because um, emotions serve a purpose. All emotions serve a purpose. They're, they're, they're not a kind of evolutionary mistake. So they, they direct our attention, they guide our behavior, they're involved in, in they're integral to decision-making and um, how we retain and act on information. So, um, but a common defense is to avoid feeling them because they are difficult um, through suppression and, and other strategies. Um, but we might not be necessarily aware that, that we are actually suppressing and avoiding them because it, it can be sort of happening unconsciously. Um, and I found in my own research that even um, people with very strong pro-environmental values um, have a tendency to want to, to suppress difficult emotions about the climate and ecological crisis out of fear that if they engage with them, that they'll get stuck in them and, and be unable to function. Now, in the short term, in certain situations, it might be appropriate to suppress emotions. So in a context where it's not safe for someone to express them in that moment. But the problem is if um, coping strategy is used all the time. So that applies to, to all of these, really. Um, it's if these are used um, long term and repeatedly. Um, and particularly with, with um, suppressing and avoiding, uh, suppressing emotions is, is physically and, and, and psychologically tiring. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and it diverts cognitive resources away from other tasks. And there's a whole load of research now um, that finds suppression of, of emotion over the, long, over the longer term is associated with negative health consequences. So the key is about how we engage with them, how we, how we work through these difficult emotions. Um, now, um, I want to show you here just one way to kind of think about this. So if you think down at this low level here, so there's a low level of, of, of engagement with emotions, so that's basically not very adaptive. So this is where we're kind of suppressing, avoiding dissociation. Um, and equally at this point here, where there's a high level of, of engagement with emotions. So this is where we can think, you know, about being overwhelmed, um, where, where we're sort of being consumed by the emotion and we can't function properly. And, you know, the ideal place to be is somewhere in the middle here, where we're giving space to the emotion, we're able to engage with it, to work through it. Um, and that's it requires some mindful detachment. Um, I'm also a, a mindfulness teacher and um, it can be really useful to, well, we use a lot of metaphors in teaching mindfulness. And one of them, which I find quite useful is, is a metaphor of a fire. So if you think about these emotions as being, you know, the fire, you don't want to be in the fire getting burnt, but equally you don't want to be so far away that you can't even feel the fire. So that's when you're completely disconnected from, from your own emotions. So you want to be near enough so you can feel the warmth, but not getting burnt. Now, um, this way of giving space to the emotions, allow ourselves to feel them, to, to express it, to work through it. Um, there's a whole load of different um, approaches that people can take to, for that. You know, certainly talking about it in climate cafes, including you know, the ones that, that Aberdeen Climate Action do and the, the Climate Psychology Alliance um, through writing, creative or artistic work. And um, for some people, prayer, ritual and other spiritual and religious practices, um, physical practices like Qigong, yoga, Tai Chi, things which help to move the energy of the emotions through the body so it doesn't become um, stuck or stagnant. So... In this way of dealing with the emotions, um, rather than driving us from behind into maladaptive responses, these difficult emotions are brought into a conscious awareness where they can be worked with um, creatively. 
Um, so finally, um, <clears throat> in terms of um, what we've found can be quite useful messages for people who are struggling with this is um, knowing that it's normal and common to feel these kind of emotions because for many people it's a feeling that they're alone with these emotions that they, they that no one else feels like this like they do or they can't talk to other people about it but actually <laughs> as we know from from the research that's not the case at all in fact most people are feeling like this um the second thing is that these feeling these emotions can be viewed positively as a sign that um, you're actually connected with the reality of of the crisis you know that is a good thing um, for people who are not feeling any of those emotions, I would be more concerned about them, actually, because that shows that, you know, there's some kind of dissociation going on or denial. Um, it's important to be checking in with yourself. You know, how are you feeling right now? Um, the, you know, I'm sure you're all aware about the issues around around burnout. Um, but being able to kind of recognize how you are feeling and to, and to just accept that what you're feeling right now is how you're feeling um taking a breathing space if that's if that's what's needed um and it might be you know that sometimes you do need to just take a step back um in order to not burn yourself out like, you know I, again it's this issue of how 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 much time you take when you step back if that becomes a permanent state then that's that that's not adaptive, but it can be useful for all of us at times to just not watch the news or not read another article. Um, and then also um, to remember that you can only do what you can individually and with others, um, keeping a sense of perspective around all of this. So yes, all of us do have responsibility, but it's not all on, on you. Um, and um, as I said before about talking with others who who will understand and will just listen and not judge you. Um, so the final point I want to make is that in acknowledging the the conflicts and tensions within us, including these different emotions, so both both positive emotions and these other more difficult emotions, that these can reside within us at the same time. So we can feel both hopeful and sad, you know, angry and 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 excited. Um, and we also all face ethical dilemmas around this. None of us are perfect. Nobody's got a, a completely adaptive response to this. And, um, and there will be moments when some of us, when, when we'll all to some extent be in denial about stuff because it is scary. Um, so, it's, yeah, the, the, the main issue here is that um, none of us are completely right or wrong in the way that we're responding. And so rather than falling into a kind of us and them, um, which can happen um, where everybody else is, is kind of the problem, um, when we realize that all of us are struggling with this, then that brings a kind of humility and that can help us to relate to each other with more compassion and um, forgiveness. So I'm going to stop sharing there, and um, that's all that I wanted to say right now. And um, I'm happy to pass over to the next speaker. <laughs>